What's up everybody, and welcome back to the series. I'm Calvin McClure. After a four-month journey through the unforgiving expanse that spans even the nearest of celestial bodies, Venus II had at long last arrived at its destination. After the towering success that had been Venus III, mission planners stood tall on the shoulders of what some feared was an overly confident state of mind. More than a simple flyby, Venus II would attempt to dip down into the upper layers of the Venusian atmosphere feel the stirring of the unknown and attempt to further unlock the mysteries hidden therein. As the probe drew nearer and the moment of its reckoning beckoned, all back on Earth held their breaths. But as it so happened, and as later telemetry analysis would reveal, the fears that many had expressed would become almost prophetic in nature. Venus II had, in fact, dipped into the atmosphere, but its eagerness would be its demise. It was only after the moment when the fate signal should have been received again had passed, and nothing but a dead silence had been heard, did mission planners now understand the fate of their overconfidence. As for what remained of Venus II, no longer able to peer into the unknown, to listen for signals from home, or to answer back, its fate would now be the lonely, dark expanse of a now seemingly vast nothingness, empty until whatever life remained in it would breathe its last. Following closely behind the now ill-fated Venus II, as soon as mission planners had heard of the fiery end that the twin sister craft had encountered, a slight enough adjustment to Venus's one course was immediately executed. The result of the course correction, executed in the final moments of just when such a thing was still possible, would raise the lowest point of travel in the Venusian atmosphere by only about 10 kilometers. But engineers and mission planners alike believed that they had successfully removed Venus 1 from any serious risks that lay ahead.
for a brief, tranquil, and celestial moment, Venus One would gracefully traverse through the Venetian atmosphere, tossed to and fro gently as in a summer breeze, its solar panels feeling the light caress of the thick clouds that covered the planet and shrouded it in such a mysterious veil. Almost as soon as it had begun, Venus One would emerge on the other side, unscathed but forever changed as when the caress of two lovers leaves an indelible and yet unnoticeable mark. With its departure from the planet now at hand, the mission that was Venus One would officially come to a close, and with it bring the end of the first ever Venusian exploration campaign. Towering in presence and might, far exceeding anything else the Florida landscape had ever seen, the agency's newest, most daring, and most capable launch vehicle yet stood poised and at the ready to take on the task that lay ahead of it. Standing over 140 feet tall and weighing in at over 1.3 million pounds, no single core rocket in the world compared. With ever more daring missions to the moon on the horizon, the agency needed greater lifting capabilities at its disposal. The proposed design, the first of the aptly named Saturn family of launch vehicles, was a two-stage configuration. The first stage utilized at its core nine clustered tanks, eight of which were derived from the agency's first orbital capable rocket, the Silverbrand ORB. At its base, nine powerful Carolox-fed H1 engines would boost the mighty rocket with a thundering roar unlike any other that had ever been heard. The second stage was all about cryogenics, and it would be powered by the most powerful Hydrolox engine ever developed, the J2. Underneath its twin payload fairings was a 15 metric ton concrete block that would serve as a mass simulator for the mission. With the full weight of the agency's hopes and dreams resting on its shoulders, Saturn roared to life for the first time.
so deafening that windows from nearby houses had been broken. Reports of a possible earthquake from several counties nearby and even stories of a would-be Soviet attack all emanating from individuals that had been unawares of the planned test flight had flooded emergency services. The world was introduced to the power of Saturn. Saturn 1 was the first of what was to become the next series of launch vehicles for the agency and ones chiefly dedicated for manned lunar exploration and beyond. But the first step for the Saturn was a demonstration flight where the sum of its parts could be shown to work as intended, not least of which was the hydrogen-fueled J2 engine. Whereas the H1s had been thoroughly ground tested, the J2 could only truly be tested in real-world conditions, with so much riding on its functioning correctly. When the time came, everyone held their breaths and waited to see if the mighty J2 would light. As the second stage, known as the S-4B, roared to life, so too did Mission Control. One of the biggest unknowns and possible mission-ending scenarios had, with the successful ignition of the J-2, been averted. With the massive payload fairings now jettisoned, the only thing that remained was for the J-2 to burn, and to burn to the full planned duration. As it did, the new and state-of-the-art suite of onboard electronics that formed the brains of the mighty Saturn beamed down streams of telemetry, which engineers and mission controllers back on the ground feverishly scrutinized and analyzed as fast and as best as they could. And to their joy and delight, everything the Saturn was telling them told them that it was good to go the distance. Immediately after the J-2 engine shut down, having burned for the full intended duration, ground controllers sent up the command, and the pre-programmed routine of on-orbit maneuvers began testing out roll, pitch, and yaw authority. And as it did, the onboard maneuvering system, integral both to the design of the S-4B and to its mission, began to fire. Accordingly, with every firing, the massive six meter wide upper stage began to roll, pitch, and yaw, a willing participant. Onboard gyros embedded in the avionics module of the S-4B recorded every change in direction, as well as any and all acceleration values. Back on the ground, engineers and mission controllers monitored and studied the data stream as it came in. But the fun wouldn't last for long. Flight planners had intentionally set the massive upper stage on a suborbital trajectory. Fears of future ramifications from such a large piece of debris prompted the decision to do so. In one of the largest Kerbal-made fireballs ever seen, the S-4B re-entered Earth's atmosphere, with some debris crashing into the Atlantic, far south of the African continent.
Launching from the Florida coast, the third installment of the planned series of test flights of the Transstage Upper Stage, which by now had become a familiar sight, soared upwards. Up to this point, the Transstage test program had been hit and miss with as many successes as there had been failures, and this mission would be no different. When the time came for the developmental upper stage to separate from its booster, its engines fired up, but the two stages remained attached to one another. Immediately, the onboard computers, sensing that something was off, shut down the twin AJ-10 engines and sent another series of commands to fire the separation bolts and ignite the engines. But again and again, the two stages remained joined until finally, succumbing to the heat of repeated firings that had built up, the separation mechanism broke, releasing the two stages from being joined to one another. Ground controllers breathed a sigh of relief, but alas, it was too little and too late, as too much time had been lost. The test stage had effectively fallen behind the curve. With too little time to right the situation, all that was left was for the trans stage to meet its demise. After yet another failed test flight of the trans stage, mission planners would quickly jump on an upcoming opportunity not to be missed. For the second time in a short while, the unparalleled power of the Saturn was felt for miles around as the nine H1 engines producing a combined output of around 1.6 million pounds of thrust shook the earth beneath it as it pushed the massive Lomgren beast skywards. The mission was the second in a planned two-flight test program to prove out the Saturn's capabilities and reliability and also to improve its overall ascent performance, and engineers wanted all the data they could get their hands on. But seeing as how troublesome the Transstage test program had been, and as important as its role would soon come to be, the two test programs joined forces to give the Transstage engineers additional invaluable testing time and data to scrutinize. The concrete blocks that were to normally have been set atop the S4B to act as a mass simulator were removed and the trans stage positioned in lieu of the dummy payload. Electrical wirings and connections were added and stage separation explosive bolts were installed, much like they had been atop the Titan. 
But for the first part of the mission, all eyes were on Saturn and its J2-powered S4B upper stage. The unique combination of power, performance, and restartability that were at the center of what made the J2 so important could only be proven and refined in flight. As the flight continued and the engine burned for a duration greater than 350 seconds, the most powerful rocket yet devised continued to impress as it hit its every mark along the way. As fate would have it, when the focus shifted from the Saturn to the trans stage, the port side engine failed to ignite, sending the upper stage in a rapid tumble. But the newly developed trans stage automated fault resolution system rapidly vented, reprimed, and repressurized fuel and oxidizer lines, and the faulty engine was brought to life. Now came the daunting task of correcting the stage's rapid tumble and resume its course to orbit. Slowly but surely, road rates would subside and the tumbling upper stage would regain its composure and heading. Engineers back on the ground could at long last breathe a sigh of relief and cheer on the tiny stage that could as it made it all the way to orbit. The first item on the list was to try and ascertain if there were any indications of critical damage that may have occurred during the problematic stage separation and that could lead to a premature end to the mission. Ground controllers having now cooled down after that initial fight and realizing they now still had a mission on hand to perform, first began by checking all of the stage's vitals. When the all-go was given, the two AJ-10s roared to life. The engine's unique abilities to be restarted again and again would be put to the test again and again. After all was said and done, every drop of fuel had been consumed and all mission objectives accomplished. Officials could at long last finally call the program flight proven and the once upon a time problematic transage flight ready. And not a moment too soon, as its biggest mission yet would soon test its worth like nothing else ever attempted before. going to do it for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. I know it was quite a long time coming. If you haven't already, please be sure to like and subscribe as it really does help the channel to grow. And let me know what your thoughts on the episode are. If you'd like to find out how you can support the channel in a special way, be sure to go and check out the Calvin McClure Patreon page. Patrons get special access and privileges for their contributions. Be sure also to stop by the Calvin McClure Discord and be part of the experience there. Thanks to everyone for your continued support of the channel. I'm Calvin McClure, and I'll see you next time.